Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 103 class on New Testament survey. So even before we could begin our session on the next letter, the letter to Colossians, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Okay. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Uh, I hope yesterday you were able to watch the session on the letter to Philippians. I've recorded and I've posted on the Google screen. Those of you who have missed to watch, I request you all to please watch those videos today. It's come in two sessions, about 15 to 20 minutes each video. So we have posted in uh, two parts, like part one and part two, because of the technical glitch which I was facing yesterday. And by God's grace, everything has been rectified and set. So today I'm able to connect online. And, you know, I hope without any interruption, we would be able to complete the class today on the letter to Colossians. So if by, while you hear the class, if you all have any questions, you all can, yes, we can take time to discuss in the class or you can write to me on the email ID that is posted on the Google screen. Okay. Yes. So we will turn to the letter to the Colossians. So we know the author, right? Who is the author? Apostle Paul is the author to the letter to Colossians, okay? And it is one of the four prison epistles. What are the four prison epistles that Apostle Paul wrote while he was in the prison at Rome? Class, what are the four prison epistles? Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and a personal letter to Philemon. So these are the four prison episodes and when was it written it was written in 60 to 61 ad approximately um, okay so as we are discussing on that let's look at the background about the city of colossae so when we look at the city the city of colossae was located about 100 miles of 100 miles east of Ephesus and 12 miles north of Lodosia. Let me present the map. Is the map been presented? Okay, thank you. Okay, so the city had a very important history. By this time, it has declined somewhat in the world significance. It was a very prosperous city in nature. How do we know it was a prosperous city? Because it was a very wealthy city. When Apostle Paul, uh, you know, uh, during his time, the city was very prosperous and doing well. And when Apostle Paul uh, uh, visit, he didn't visit this place. This church was not founded or formed by Apostle Paul. What happened? Oh, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, guys. Okay. As I was sharing the screen to the students on campus, I have not shared the screen with you. Sorry. Um, give me a minute. Thank you. It's coming. 
Okay, this is the Colossians, the ruins of Colossians. Yes, supremacy of Jesus in all things. This is the map that we are talking about. We see Colossae here in Asia Minor. Okay, we are able to see Colossae, right? Are you able to see my cursor? No, we have Colossae. No. Okay, but we're able to see Colossia where it is. It is in the map, Asia Minor, you see there. Okay. So, Colossae was, in Paul's days, a decaying city. In ancient records, it, it has been uh, in ancient record it's been described as one of the very prosperous and a prominent great city. But by the time Apostle Paul wrote this letter, it was not in the state which was known because there was a, a great earthquake. Even while he uh, after he wrote this letter in few years, the city was attacked by a great earthquake and the complete city was destroyed. But then the people of Colossae came together, they tried to rebuild the city, but there are certain places in the city still remain to be as ruins. Um, yeah, then later, uh, you know, after Paul's time, many generations later, the city of Colossae is, I mean, disappeared from the history itself because the Turks destroyed the city completely and they have mentioned and even about the city is not been mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament other than this letter of Colossians. So one of the reasons why was this letter written? We need to look at it. Just give me a minute. So even before I could mention why was this letter written, we need to know how was this church formed. If Apostle Paul has not visited Colossae, so how was this church formed? This church, as per Acts chapter 19, can I request you all to please turn to Acts chapter 19? Verse 10. Can I request one of you all to please read? And this really works with you. So that all those who ate them heard the word of the Lord Jesus and told to Okay. So this is what the scholars say. When Apostle Paul was preaching at Ephesus, so all the people in Asia were present there heard the gospel, received the gospel, and then they carried this word to different places. So there was a person by the name Epaphroditus. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it is believed that he carried the gospel to Colossae and he preached there and he formed the church. So the church was formed at Colossae, at Colossae by Epaphroditus. And He's been mentioned three times in the New Testament, twice in the letter to Colossians. Now we need to know who is this person? Who was Epaphroditus? He's also mentioned in the Colossians as Epaphras. Okay, and once he's also mentioned in the letter to Philemon. So he seemed to be a believer in Christ who served Apostle Paul. Um, Eventually, during the, one of the missionary journeys, as Apostle Paul was ministering at Ephesus, maybe uh, if Aphroditus met Apostle Paul there and learned about the gospel and carried the gospel to Colossians, and he planted a church there. But then he was in touch with Apostle Paul. So what he does is when Apostle Paul was in the prison, he carries a report to Apostle Paul about certain things that is happening at Colossae. What's happening? There are a lot of heresy that has been spreading by the Judaizers. 
So Ifafras is also name is the full name of him is Ifafroditis, and in short, is called as Ifafras, but he is the same person. So he carries a letter to Apostle Paul. Now to know the background of Ifafras was he was a Gentile. And he was from Colossae, from Asia Minor. His name appears in the letter about three times in the New Testament in this letter and once in the letter to Philemon. And he was the one who shared the gospel to the Colossians and probably started a church there. And Paul uh, speaks or addresses Ephesus very highly, saying that um, he is my... Uh, he, uh, you know, he addresses him like faithful servant, fellow servant, faithful minister, a servant of Christ Jesus, one who shared the gospel, one who co-worked along with Apostle Paul. And we also see that Apostle, the relationship between Apostle Paul and Epaphras was something like the spiritual father and a shepherd to him. So Paul describes him very dearly in this letter, whereas um, these uh, words shows that the compassion that Apostle Paul had towards if I for a saying, uh, you know, with so much of admiration, he addresses him in the letter. So, yeah, he was mightily used by God to share the gospel in Asia Minor and start a church at Colossians. So this is what the background we want to learn about Ephesus, how was he related to Apostle Paul. So in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, can I request you all to turn to Colossians? Chapter 2, verse 1. Yeah, thank you. So here we see that how Apostle Paul addresses him, saying that any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, in any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being a one thought of one mind. is just showing what the mindset of Ephesus and the mindset of Apostle Paul. Even he carries the same love, same affection towards you all. So that you all grow in the love of Jesus Christ. Later part, we also see how Ephesus prays for the people of Colossians along with Apostle Paul. He mentions all this because Apostle Paul is uh, commending the leadership of Ephesus in this church, saying that come in subjection to the leadership of Ephesus. Be submissive to him because even he has a like mind like me. He, he is a servant of Christ. He wants to see you all grow in the Lord. He's commending him. And we also see the church at Colossae was most um, likely under the leadership of Ephesus and they were with him. But then what happened? Suddenly, there were a few Judaizers. Wherever the church was planted by Apostle Paul or any of these ministry leaders, the, the Judaizers carried these false teaching and they came against the church. They came against the teaching of Jesus Christ. So that was the very purpose of Apostle Paul writing this letter. So I would like to mention what were certain heresies that they brought against the church. So that was the purpose. So there were four heresies, four heresies that uh, Ephesus or the church at Colossae was facing for which Ephesus carried those details, uh, came to Apostle Paul and met him in the prison and asked him for help to address against these four heresies. So what are they? First one, to warn them against the human philosophy and to urge them to give Christ the supreme place, the preeminence. The heresy, the false teaching of these Judaizers were, were against Christ, were against the supremacy of Jesus Christ. The second heresy was to warn them against the ritualism of 
Judaizers, they were emphasizing the believers in the church to follow the rituals what they were following. So they were a lot of Gentile believers in this church. And they were again, they were saying like, you need to be circumcised, you need to keep up the Sabbath and many other rituals that, the, that these Judaizers were carrying. If you are a believer, you need to follow all these things. They were carrying certain ritualistics in the church. The third point uh, was addressed as to warn them against the worship of angels and mysticism. So he's been addressing that these Judaizers were carrying the false heresy and emphasizing on the worship or the belief in angels. The fourth one is to warn them against asceticism. Now, what is asceticism? means a doctrine that through self-torture or self-denial, one can discipline himself to reach a higher state, spiritual or intellectual. So this was asceticism. So they were trying to emphasize this in the church. So Euphorus carries all these four things that the church was facing at Colossae, and he brings it to Apostle Paul in the prison and he requests him to help him to address these issues so that I can go and minister back at the church in Colossae. Give me a minute. Yeah, here's the heresies. And there's somewhere, uh, uh, some heresies that along with that four heresies that I addressed, some of them were addressed like, you know, in chapter 1, 15 to 20, we also say the spirit is good, the matter is evil. They talk about the body, the body is evil. And again, in chapter 2, it's been addressing that one must follow uh, the rituals or the restrictions in order to be saved or perfected. And again, in chapter 2, we see certain heresies like one must deny the body and live in strict asceticism, follow and worship the angels. Then in, again, in chapter 1 and 2, it talks about Christ could not be both human and divine. So they are questioning the very deity of Christ uh, because they were mostly talking about the gospel. They were mostly sharing that Jesus was the Savior. He was the Son of God who, who came into this world, who died for us. And this was the gospel message of Jesus Christ about his death, burial, cruc I mean, and resurrection and ascension. They were preaching about. And this Judaizers, the false teachers, came against the teaching and questioned the deity of Jesus Christ. And we also see that one must obtain a secret knowledge in order to be saved or perfected. And this was not available to everyone. And, um, we also see that one must adhere to human wisdom, tradition, and philosophies. It is even better to combine aspects of several religions and in chapter 3, it says there is nothing wrong with immorality. There's nothing wrong with immorality. This is something we are coming against the teaching of the gospel. So in, in the letter to Colossians, we have about four chapters. The first chapter talks about in Christ alone. In Christ alone. Chapter 2 talks about living in the light of God's grace. Living in the light of God's grace. So every heresy that has been addressed, Apostle Paul is trying to give an explanation for that. And then in chapter 3, we see walking with God as his chosen one. And chapter 4 talks about walking in steadfast wisdom and prayer. 
as he's been addressing to these chapters, to these four chapters, we see in chapter one, in chapter one, when we go through Colossians chapter one, verse one to 14. Here we see Apostle Paul is addressing about preeminence of Christ. He's convicting them who Jesus Christ is, what Christ mean to each of us or to you. He's addressing and acknowledging to them, saying, for, I'm on uh, chapter 1, verse 9. He talks about, for this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and, uh, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So what we learn from here is when we read further, okay, let me read further and then try to make a point here. Verse 10, he says, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And he also, uh, you know, uh, emphasizes on the deity of Jesus Christ. Verse 15, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things we may have the preeminence. So Apostle Paul, knowing the people of Colossae, is praying for them, for them to have the knowledge and the spiritual understanding. Even if he writes, the spiritual understanding can only come from God alone. Because the scripture says, unless and until the Father calls to him, he cannot know me. Even if they read, they cannot. Your Apostle Paul, along with the Epaphras, pray with one and God for the people in Colossae as he writes this letter saying that I pray that you may receive the knowledge, the spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy to the Lord by fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. Only one can understand God if he increases in the knowledge of God. So for them, see, he is not addressing that every question that comes. He is only emphasizing the truth of the gospel. One way to address the heresies is not to talk about the false teachers, or to talk about the heresies. One way to address the false teachers and the false teaching is only by emphasizing the truth, emphasizing the gospel again and again and again. Because the scripture clearly says, from then till our time, even now, it's the same thing. Like you teach the truth. Let the truth set them free. So all we need to do and learn from the letter of Colossae is let's emphasize the truth and allow the Lord to give them the knowledge and set them free. 
So the understanding comes from God. This is what Apostle Paul prays in chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. He says, I pray, I pray that you may be filled with the knowledge and the wisdom and spiritual understanding. So this can only come by God himself. So that each of us can be freed from you know, any of the false heresies that can come against us. So this is what we learn from the letter to Colossians, how Apostle Paul witnessed and taught the church in Colossae against these false heresies that came against them. And in chapter 3 and 4, he emphasizes uh, mostly, see, chapter 1 and 2, he talks about correcting the wrong thinking by praying and asking God, God, you give them good understanding. Let the spiritual understanding come to them. You increase them in the knowledge of God. Okay, so he's trying to correct them in the thinking. And in chapter 3 and 4 is mostly emphasizing on correcting on wrong living. He's correcting on the lifestyle because the Judaizers were, uh, the false teachers were emphasizing on the ritualistic and the aesthetic living style on the morality. So Apostle Paul is addressing those issues and he's trying to bring correction in their living or in their lifestyle. So in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, it talks about, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you die. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So he is again emphasizing on Jesus Christ when it comes to our living when it comes to our lifestyle so your apostle paul in this chapter you know chapter chapter 3 verse 12 13 he's he's also emphasizing uh like you know therefore as an elect of god that is as a, a child of god uh for you you need to be holy and beloved put on tender mercies kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So what is making Apostle Paul to address and write all these minute details? But he is mentioning all this because this is the nature of God. If you have God's love in you, you need to imitate that in your lifestyle. So what is making Apostle Paul to write this? Because the false teachers or the Judaizers who came into this church, they were, uh, they were teaching them about uh, aestheticism. What is aestheticism? Giving them a pride, thinking that they are God, they are above everything. I should not submit to another. I should not give in to another person. I am everything. I am above everything. So it is only increasing the pride in them and drawing them away from the teaching of Christ. So what did Apostle Paul do? Apostle Paul did not say anything against those teachings, but then he is emphasizing on the right teaching. Who is Christ Jesus? What did Jesus do? Jesus been equal with God. He came into this world. He humbled himself. He died on the cross for you and me. And he's teaching on the Christ love. So we need to be tender mercy. We need to be kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering, patient, bearing with one another. He's emphasizing again on the gifts or the fruit of the spirit. These are the fruit of the Spirit. We need to be, if we have the love of Christ in us, we need to be, we need to be imitator of Jesus Christ. How? By this fruit, by this nature of God. 
by submit submitting to each other by considering the other person better than ourselves this is what apostle paul also thought to the church at philippians consider another person better than yourself given to each other in meekness, kindness, tender mercy, forgiveness, forgive each other. If anyone has complained against each other, even as Christ forgive, you forgive again and again. He is bringing Jesus Christ. You see, Apostle Paul is waiting for a chance. Every problem, every issues, he addresses the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because only the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to deliver, has the power to give answer to every solution. And in 15, he says, let the peace of God rule your heart. Because our heart should not be troubled. Our heart should not be distant because our heart is the dwelling place where God dwells in us. So Apostle Paul is emphasizing on it, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled because you need to have the peace of God for you to exercise the fruit of the Spirit. So he's releasing the peace of Christ into the heart. He's saying, let the peace of God rule your heart to which you were called in one body and be thankful. And then verse 16, it talks about, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. See, these are the declaration that Apostle Paul is speaking against the people of Colossae. You see, this is what God did even at the very beginning, at the creation. When, when we turn to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, we see that God saw let me turn to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, and I request one of you all to please read. Chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. In the beginning, God created the man the Darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, And there be light, and there was light. Thank you, Vimil. So, what we see here, what did God see? What did God see? The earth was without form, it was void, there was darkness on the face of the earth. This is what God saw. But what did God speak? He spoke something opposite, right? What he said, God saw and he said, let there be light and there was light. The earth was filled with darkness, but God spoke something opposite. He did not speak, hey, there's darkness. Let me do something. No, he directly spoke something opposite. That is, let there be light. Same thing Apostle Paul is doing here. Same thing Apostle Paul is doing here to the Church of Colossae. The report that he got was darkness. But here he's declaring light into this place. He's declaring in verse 16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts, to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So he's just emphasizing the truth, expecting the Lord to minister to the people of Colossae so that they may grow in God's wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. They may be blessed richly in God's wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that they may understand the false teaching which these false teachers are bringing against the church. So he's speaking God's word, he's declaring, and he's along with that, he is praying. And that's the reason, one of the reasons why the church in Colossae had a transformation 
inside out their heart was transformed they were able to understand the truth they were able to face the heresy with the truth and in chapter 4 verse 7 to 8 18 okay 7 to 18 here he teaches the example of the christian fellowship In the final greetings, he talks about Tichikas, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstance and comfort your hearts. So he is not rebuking the church. He understands that they are weakness. He understands that they are growing. But then he's praying over them and he's saying, I'm sending a leader to you. He understands you. He will comfort you. And also he talks about the Onesimus. We will know more about him when we uh, study on the letter to Philemon. He was a runaway slave from Philemon. And he's addressing about Onesimus, saying that he's a faithful and a beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. And he's just writing a letter of comfort to them. And you know, uh, how as a Christian fellowship, how we need to be connected with one another and how uh, we need to grow in the Lord with one another. And he's also teaching, submit to each other. These are the leaders in the Christ. Submit to them. They would bring the right teaching to you. Some of the key words that we see in this letter is uh, all, every, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. The preferences have been given. And also a reference to Christ has been emphasized many times in this letter. About I'm not too sure about the number because even I didn't count how many, but uh, some scholars say about 74. I'm not too sure. But it has been addressed Christ many times because he's trying to emphasize the sonship of Jesus Christ. I'm just going back to the slides. Yeah. So the theme of this letter is Christ is our supreme Lord and sufficient Savior. Christ is our supreme Lord and sufficient Savior. Some of the heresies, you know, Apostle Paul addressed is yeah, in the slide. Let me put that. Uh, okay, these are the ones. Okay. The so, Apostle Paul is talking and encouraging the believers. The responsibility of a believer to put off the old man and put on the new man. Is this slide changed? My, okay. are you all able to see the difference between the old man and the new man? No. Okay. He's encouraging the believers in the church to put off the old man and put on the new man. The old man maybe about lying but he's uh, apostle paul is encouraging as a believer in christ you need to be speaking the truth and uh, the old man may steal and in the new man as a new man you need to be honest labor and and he's also encouraging in giving um and then the old man maybe there's corrupt in communication but then as a new person in Christ, you need to be edifying the conversation. And in the old man, we may carry the bitterness. But as a new creation in Christ Jesus, we need to be kind, tender-hearted, loving, forgiving. You know, he brings all this into this. And then, um, yeah, against the malice, it is love. And if you have fornication, do good. Goodness is about everything. And he talks about uh, uncleanness, covetousness, drunkenness, which is the old nature. But as a new man, you need to be righteous, truth, being filled with the Holy Spirit. 
as he's been addressing in all this some of some things he's been emphasizing about jesus christ in this letter when we read in chapter 1 verse 13 to 22 chapter 1 verse 13 to 22 when we read he says he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love who is the son of is love jesus and verse 13 he also says mm, yeah the king of the kingdom of light who is the king of the kingdom jesus and in verse 14 he talks about in whom we have redemption so redemption is nothing but a redeemer then only we can have a redemption. So who is the redeemer that Apostle Paul is addressing here? Jesus. And also in verse 14, he says, talks about the forgiveness of sins. So who is the forgiver who can forgive our sins? Jesus. And also in verse 15, he talks about, he is the image of the invisible God. Who is the image of the invisible God here? Jesus. He is emphasizing on Jesus because the heresy came against the deity of Jesus. So every verse here has been addressing who is Jesus to us. He also says the firstborn over all creation. So who is the firstborn? Jesus. And he also addresses in verse 16. Okay. He is addressing on uh, for by him all things were created. So who created all things that is in heaven or on, on earth? So he's saying in the beginning when God created everything, it was not only God the Father. You see the triune God. God said, let us create. When we read, I'm sure you would have studied in the Holy Spirit class and also in Christology. God says, let us create. So whom is Father addressing? Let us, the triune God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So your Apostle Paul is addressing that nothing was created without Jesus. Everything that was created in heaven, on earth, so everything by him is addressing. The object of creation is Jesus. The agent of creation is Jesus. And in verse 17, he talks about and he is before all things and in them all things consist so who is he here he is jesus he is the pre-existent one now also talks about the self sustainer of the universe he was the he created and the later part in verse 18 we see that he was the head of the body the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and that in all things he may have the preeminence. So he is addressing Jesus as the head of the body, the firstborn from the dead, and the preeminent one. And later part, when we read 19, 20, 21, and 22, Apostle Paul is addressing Jesus as the fullness of the Godhead. And then he says he is the reconciler of the world to God and he is the perfecter of the body. And this is one of the reasons why you need to accept Jesus. Because he is God. He is co-equal with God. He was, when he was on this earth, he was 100% man and 100% God. This is what Apostle Paul was addressing about Jesus. And these are the few of the key verses that I um, listed here that Jesus is the uh, image of the invis invisible God. I think most of them we covered. Yeah. You have taken a look at it. Okay. 
to come to the end of it. So our view of Jesus will impact every area of our life. This is what Apostle Paul emphasized to the church in Colossae. They were very innocent believers. That is why Apostle Paul is not being very stern with them. He's not stern with them, but he is addressing the gospel again and again with very tender heart. And he's actually addressing, I'm sending this letter with Tychicus. Okay, he's a fellow servant in Christ Jesus. He's also, he will come with comforting words to you. So he's sending the letter with a word of comfort to them and he's saying, I understand. One of the reasons is Apostle Paul did not visit them face to face. So he's saying that I will, once I'm released from the prison, I will come and meet you face to face. He's encouraging them that he will come and meet them. Second, because he didn't found this church, he didn't know them personally. But then he knew the leaders of the church personally because they have met them and they have the heart for this people to know Christ. So he is encouraging, acknowledging and commending the leaders in this letter, saying they are the fellow uh, servant, faithful ministers. They have the same heart as what I have in sharing the gospel. So he's commanding them and he's comforting them and teaching them the gospel again. And the same word today for us, Apostle Paul is ministering to us as a leader. Yes, he's commanding us, you are the fellow servant in Christ. You are partner with me in this gospel. You are the faithful minister. So as leaders to each of us, Apostle Paul is commanding. And also he's emphasizing us as leaders carry the gospel. Do not talk about the heresy. Do not give prominence to the heresies, but then share the truth. Emphasize on the truth. Let the truth set people free. And he's encouraging you and me. And, uh, and he's asking us, allow the Jesus Christ, allow the word of the gospel, penetrate into every area to us and to the church so that that has the power to deliver us from every heresy, from every issue, from every circumstance and situation. So this is something very practical to you and I. What would we do if we were in place of Apostle Paul? Are we following Jesus as we should? We need to question ourselves and see how to minister to the wrong teachings, to the wrong heresies that may come against our church, that may come against our leadership. How are we going to face them? We don't have to defend every claim that comes against us, but trust God to be our defender. Just as our Paul, you know, did he trusted God. Even in the letter to Philippians, we see when Apostle Paul was put into the prison. He was just not pushed into the prison. Okay, he was pushed into the deeper inner cell. That is, you know, one level of prison and then there's an inner cell. But Apostle Paul was put into that inner cell that is, should be like a dark dungeon. And look at the intents of the punishment. They chained both his feet. Both his feet was chained. Why did they do it? Anyway, he's in the prison. In the prison, they put him into the inner cell. Like as though he was a big crime, big murderer. But what they were trying to do, the Romans were just trying to affect his mindset. His mindset saying that you are you are a deep or a, uh, what do you say? Uh, the intensity of the punishment is so much. It, you're in chains. Even if he's in the first prison, it's, he's under the bar. But he put him there. Intensity just increased. But then Apostle Paul and Silas, they were not worried. They were, didn't even pay the attention of the circumstance of, uh, you know, what the Romans put them into. The whole attitude changed. They just sang and praised God. And the heaven responded to them by shaking the foundation of that prison cell and all the gates, the scripture says, all the gates were open along with the chains which their foot was tied on. So who is the man who can put 
servant of God under the prison. The same like that Apostle Paul is ministering to Colossae, who can come against the Christ, the teaching of Christ and Christ. So he emphasizes on Jesus Christ. So today you and me may be in such situation. No matter what is against us, no matter what type of giant, maybe not Goliath against us, but there may be a giant that is against us. But today, Apostle Paul is encouraging you and I as a leader, as a fellow worker, as a faithful minister. Bring your case to Christ and just pray as just Apostle Paul prayed. He prayed, Lord, increase us in your wisdom, knowledge and understanding. Increase the people also in that same, the will of wisdom of God, knowledge and understanding that they may understand what we understand. So it's only the Father who can give understanding to each other. It's not our word. We cannot defend, but the Lord can defend. Okay, so today I end this letter with saying, let our complete dependency be on Christ Jesus. Let Christ be our sufficiency. He is the supremacy. Jesus is the supremacy of all things. This is what the letter to Colossians mean, and let it mean to us. So let's pray. Father, I surrender each of us into your hand, each and every ministry leader into your hand. I pray that, Lord, every claim that comes against them, every claim that comes against the ministry, the church, Lord, I pray that you will be the defender. You will increase us and the church and the ministries, leaders, in the will and wisdom of God, knowledge and understanding, that we may understand, we may see the things as our you see. We may be able to understand as you understand, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who, who, who gives us the understanding, who defends us. Let us focus on you, O oh Lord so that the truth will set us free. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. I hope this uh, letter to Colossians was a blessing to each of us. God bless and see you all in the next class. Thank you. God bless.